Transfiguration Sunday. It's a, a Sunday that I would put up there with other Sundays during the year as being very important for us to remember. It's a Sunday that, that we recall Jesus uh, uh, climbing a mountain with his inner circle of Peter, James, and John. And there, as he's on top of this mountain, uh, Elijah and uh, Moses meet with him, and, and Jesus is transfigured, turned white as snow. And uh, it's hard sometimes for us to, to comprehend, but it's an important one for us to remember, because it is an important point in Jesus' life. The Neals had just left for a cruise and come back, and there's been several others. And, and I, I just I, I always take my hand and put it up next to theirs, and can't believe that the uh, uh, that how how they're tan and how healthy they look and such, and uh, how how weak and timid and light I look, you know, in the sense of that. But um, as I was talking to them about their cruise, they had a great time and such. And I, I was telling the story about. Uh, this magician that, that was a part of the cruise, that was part of a show, and so this magician every night would do his show, his magic show, but the, the captain's parrot uh, would, would hang out while he was doing his show, and the captain's parrot was, was a very ornery, a very ornery parrot. Anybody own a parrot? <laughs> Paul does. Paul's got one that, that, that is kind of ornery, and, uh, and such. But you, Every time this magician, no matter what he was doing, whether it was pulling a rabbit out of the hat or sawing a woman in half, um, the parrot would say, It's fake! It's fake! It's fake! It's no trick! It's fake! Well, this, this magician was just, you know, mortified because he would be doing his darndest to try to entertain these people with doing his magic of making things disappear, and this parrot would go, It's fake! It's fake! And so he just got so frustrated, so frustrated, but it was the captain's parrot. He didn't dare go and, and have it served for lunch anyway. So he, he just had to put up with it. Well, during the middle of one of his shows, there was this horrible storm. Just, it just suddenly came. It was a perfect storm. The waves were crashing, and finally the waves knocked the ship over, and it began to sink. And it just so happened that the parrot and the magician landed in the same lifeboat. And so for a couple of days, they just, they just sat in this, this life boat and just stared at each other. The magician wished that the parrot would drown, in the, in the, and we just can't figure out what the parrot was thinking until finally the parrot says, All right, where'd the boat go? Where'd the boat go? Where'd the boat go? <laughs> <laughs> ah. <laughs> anyway. He was overwhelmed by what had happened and could not comprehend that the magician could make the boat disappear. <laughs> you get it? You get it? Okay. Uh, smart, smart, smart. Well, today, transfiguration is, is, is a point where Peter, James, and John are overwhelmed by what they see and what they experience. And so as we, as we listen to these words from the 17th chapter of John, or Matthew, I want you to, to comprehend. And there's these first three words that I will drawn later that I want you to recall. Six days later, that's what I want you to remember, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and his brother John, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. He was transfigured before them. His face, his face shone like a sun, and his clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly there appeared to him, to them, Moses and Elijah, talking with him. Then Peter said to to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will make three dwellings here, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. And while he was still speaking, suddenly a bright cloud overshadowed them. And from the cloud, a voice said, this is my son, the beloved. With him, I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell up to the ground and were overcome by fear. But Jesus came and touched them, saying, Get up and do not be afraid. And when they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus himself alone. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus ordered them, Tell no one about the vision until after the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. Amen. The transfiguration is, is that moment. It's a, a moment in which God reveals himself and reveals who Jesus is. It is uh, an epiphany. This is the season of epiphany in which, which is one of those revealing moments that we experience God in our lives. 
And for Peter, James, and John, there they were on this mountain atop with, with Jesus. And suddenly uh, there appeared before them was Moses and Elijah, and, and Jesus shone as bright as snow, as bright as snow. So it, it was a moment for them that, that uh, became what we would call a, a mountaintop experience for them. Mountaintop in the sense that for a moment they, they experienced that, that presence of God and, and God had revealed himself and who Jesus was. It's important for us to realize that while we read the scripture, Matthew begins it by saying it is six days later. And what he's pointing back to is what he wants us to look back to is that six days before, as they were in, in Sisera Philippi, as they were walking in that region, which is not very far from uh, Mount Tabor where, where, this, where this occurred, that Jesus was, was talking to his disciples and asked the question, who do they say that I am? Now that's, that should be familiar to you and why it's important in this scripture. Who do they say that I am? And the disciples answered, well, some say that you're Elijah, some say that you're Jeremiah, some say that you're John the Baptist. And so as Jesus is trying to figure out who are they saying that I am, he turns to Peter and he says, to, and to the other disciples, well, then who do you say that I am? And Peter gives his affirmation of faith, his, his witness of faith that has become important for us to remember, but Peter himself says, you are you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And so six days later, Jesus takes Peter, James, and John up to Mount Tabor. Now, Mount Tabor is just right outside of Nazareth, not very far. You, you can see Nazareth from Mount Tabor. Mount Tabor sits out in the valley, kind of out, out by itself. And as, as I've read this story, as I've been and seen where this is, it reminds me of those kinds of hideout places where boys would go and, and play. We, would, we, would, we always had the woods that we ran to and we, we played all kinds of games. And I can imagine Jesus, as he was growing up, he was familiar with Mount Tabor. It's a place where he'd climb up to the top with his pals and they'd hang out and they'd play and they, and they would be boys. And so taking his pals, his inner circle, his closest friends, James and John and Peter, was an opportunity maybe to show that place where he grew up, that place where he enjoyed as a, a young boy. It is in that moment on that model top that the transfiguration took place. That it was important that God revealed who Jesus was. Peter knew the answer, but then God himself confirmed what, what Peter had said, that this is my son whom I love, listen to him. These words are important for us to understand and that's why the transfiguration is important because it is from that moment on that Jesus then turns his eyes and his face towards Jerusalem. And it's interesting, as we end this season of Epiphany, we begin the season of Lent and the focus of Lent is the cross. And as Jesus is turning his eyes towards Jerusalem, his eyes are upon the cross knowing full well what he has in store for him. But here we have this revealing, this is my son, whom I love, and listen to him. So I'd like to kind of unwrap each one part of that statement as a way of understanding why they are important to us. This is my son was a way of, of, of God, in a sense, confirming that this is my son. Now, God has, has been very much a part of the history of the Israelites, but this has become a mountaintop experience in the sense for, for the Israelites as Elijah and Moses and Jesus appear in the same place. Moses being the one who, who brought the law. Elijah, the prophet, the great prophet, and both of them, we don't know exactly what happened, but supposedly... They never died. They were just taken up to heaven. They are so special and so much of spiritual giants of the, of, of the people, of the children of Israel, that they are upheld head and shoulders above other prophets and above anybody else. Moses and Elijah and Jesus. And for us to understand this is that in that we have the law and the prophets and the one who come to fulfill both. 
For Jesus in his teachings said that I did not to take one iota of change in the law, nor did I change what the prophets have foretold. I have come to fulfill, to fulfill the law and the prophets. That in that, I'm going to show you a, a new way, which is the way of love. So for God to say, this is my son, it's important for us to remember that basically he is claiming Jesus. And in that, Jesus is going to be the fulfillment of God's love for the world at that time. This weekend, we are celebrating our, our second uh, child's uh, 30th birthday. And so we gathered Friday and we had a part of a party and, and then we gathered yesterday and, and we had a, a great time. Tommy is um, our middle child. Tommy was the brightest kid this, and the, the best athlete, but he was the one that always struggled to make it through. It took seven years for him to get through college. And, and so it was, it was always, always trying to be there, trying to encourage him and such. And, 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 um, but anyway, the day he graduated from college, he said, okay, Tommy, we, with all of our kids, we, we bought something to commemorate the day. And, he said, is there something that you would like that, that we could kind of buy for you? And he said, you know, I want a bicycle. I, I want a bicycle. And so um, this picture sits on my, on my dresser, and I look at it every day. It's a picture of Tommy holding his, his bicycle. And uh, to me, that's, that's like the picture we have up there, the guy who makes it to the top of the mountain. Um, this is an example of victory for him. But when he was trying bicycles, we were at the bike shop and we were trying bicycles on for size and we finally got one and he was looking at it and Janet was standing next to him. This is the kind of sense of humor Dan, uh, Tommy has. Is that he said, he looked over to Janet and says, okay, now when I get this, I can start working for Jimmy John's. <laughs> After graduating from college, he's going to deliver sandwiches. But that's Tommy. And, and so... I was telling him what I was preaching on this weekend, and, and I said, Tommy, as I pulled him aside, I said, I, I want you to know how much I love you. I love you from the very first time that I, I held you. And that I always love you, and, and I want to be there for you, and I want you to know how much I care about you. So I had this opportunity to stand and take him aside and, and talk about that. And so what God is doing on that mountaintop in bringing Jesus to light in this transfiguration is basically shining his light upon Jesus and saying, this is my son. This is my son. And so as, as we understand how important that is, it's important for us to understand that God is confirming what he has chosen to do through the history of, 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 of Israel's history. The second statement is, um, whom I love. Now, if, if we look at the Bible, we understand that the Bible is a love story. As I talked last week about how it, from the beginning to the end, uh, it is all about love and God, and Jesus is that fulfillment of that love, but whom I love. But as we, we have from the very beginning, from, from Adam, who, who was created out of love, but yet God disappointed God. We have Abraham, who, who in a sense was chosen out of all the people in the world at that time to be the father of, 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 the, of, of the Jewish faith. And yet, he doubted God. When, when God even put, pro, made the promise that I will provide you with a son and you will have more descendants than all of the stars in the sky. And he doubted God and, and had a, a relationship with a slave and had another son. Ishmael, because he, he feared that he would not ever have that son. We move on through the, the scriptures and, and, and realize that, that, that David, God had a great love for David, chosen and anointed him as, as king. Yet as a king, he, 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 he had a heart for, for God himself. But yet he abused his power and disappointed God. Solomon was as wise as anybody that's ever lived. And yet, Solomon disappointed God by, by bringing in other religions and allowing it to, to, to muddy up that of the Israelites. So all through the Bible, we see that God has, has loved those all along the way. But it's when Christ comes, his love is finally fulfilled in his son. This is my son whom I love. 
that that love, that, that passion to, to reconnect, to redeem the world, to bring it back to him, was finally fulfilled in, in Jesus. And so that's important for us to understand that it is a mountaintop experience for Jesus as well, because he's got his face turned towards, uh, towards Jerusalem, knowing full well that that fulfillment does not come until his death and the cross and resurrection. Lastly, God says, listen to him. Listen to him. Now, those disciples had hung out with Jesus for three years, and as close as anybody could possibly be to, to Jesus in, in, in learning and, 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 and absorbing all that Jesus had to say. But even, even then, they struggled with, with how to take what Jesus said and, and apply it in their, in their lives. And here it is, 2,000 years later, we still struggle in trying to live out those words in, in, in what Jesus shared and what he taught. This evening, um, Rebecca and I are going to be talking about the teachings of Jesus. And, and so we're going to be passing out these testaments that, that Carl Dance uh, gets through the Gideons that we'll pass out to talk about. But the, the New Testament, that, that as we talk about the stories of Jesus that we're all familiar with, the Good Samaritan story that, that tells us about a father who loves his son so much that he, he goes out to the end of the road just hoping and longing that his father, that his son is going to, to return home. The, the story of the Good Samaritan, who, who as, we, as we see one who is, who is left to die on the side of the road, a Levite and a priest walk on by, it was the Good Samaritan who, who picks him up and, and takes him and, and helps him get back on his feet again. The story of, of, of the, the sower that went out to plant seeds, and he planted this, threw his seeds out, and some fell on good soil, and the other fell upon rocks. About how our faith needs to be like a seed that we need to nurture and refresh and renew. And so we will spend tonight time talking about those, those lessons that Jesus has taught and the stories that he told that we call parables that we still struggle with. Stories about a God who loves us, about how we're supposed to love our neighbor, and that we're supposed to take care of our faith. We too, 2,000 years later, still struggle with the words that Jesus taught. You see that Jesus brought a, a new way, a way of love that fulfilled the law and fulfilled the prophets, a way that teaches about love and mercy, about compassion and caring. Every Sunday we pray, we pray the Lord's Prayer we say on earth as it is in heaven. And our hope is that, that we will bring a little bit of heaven here on earth by the ways that we, we live that. And I, I, I honestly see these glimpses of heaven here in this, this, this church. Every Tuesday night, I see our fellowship hall turned into community meals as we are feeding those who are lost and lonely, those who are looking not only for a meal and some of those who, who, who haven't probably eaten much all day long, but also those looking for companionship and care that somebody would just, just like to see a smile. Every year we, we host the in-gathering and suddenly we transform this church from a church building to a, a mission depot as people bring their, their layouts and their, their school kits and, and they are sent from here from all over the world. I see it every Sunday in our gatherings best as people are welcomed into the church, they're greeted as, as, as if we are so happy that you are here. But also, that gathering space also provides life. As this last week on Tuesday, we hosted the blog drive. So it's just not sitting empty. It's being used during the week as a way of supplying. A week ago, it was full of Girl Scout cookies and being sent all over to support the Girl Scouts. You should have been here. It was awesome. But in and throughout all of our churches, even our pastor studies, it's not a place where where, where Matt and I go and study and, and, and hide under a rock trying to learn a word or two to say on Sunday mornings. But those studies are more like an emergency room when people come and their lives are all falling to pieces and they're trying to put their life back together. To me, this is where we see the glimpses of heaven, the place where we show compassion and care, where we live out the love that, that Jesus came to show. Love. 
God so loved the world that he sent his son. On a mountaintop with his closest friends, we hear the words, this is my son, whom I love. Listen to him. Do you hear that? I hear it again. And I hear it again and again. Because that is what we are to be about. To listen to what Jesus is saying. That we might live out his love, his life, and be the light to the world. Let us pray. Gracious and only God, we come before you mindful that you sent your Son to bring us life and life, hope and love. Bless us, Lord, as we seek to listen to him and to do your will. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.